So joining us tonight as our keynote, uh, there are packets on your table that give more in-depth bios, but I wanted to just say a couple brief words. Uh, Dr. Moran Miragani, he's Executive Vice President Engineering and Chief of Engineering Research at the Carlsbad, California-based West Wireless Health Institute. Uh, the, the institute was founded in March 2009 by Gary and Mary West and is committed to the acceleration of wireless health technology and innovation. And Dr. Maragani is spearheading the institute's engineering and academic initiatives. Pleased to have him. Uh, Dr. Maragani will be followed by a company presentation to be given by Christina Wallman. Christina is founder and CEO of VGI Inc a developer of social networking software as a service platforms for fitness, corporate wellness, and life coach leaders, uh, which are designed to connect end users and foster participation through peer group support and feedback. Uh, as I mentioned, David here joins us as a panelist also from Acacia Venture Partners. And David will provide insights from the perspective of an investor in healthcare fitness wellness and the boomer market opportunities. Michael Williams is the CEO of Santa Barbara based ITMP technology. Uh, he'll join our discussion as a panelist as well. ITMP is actively engaged in the mobile health app marketplace and the company won the, con the best consumer application award in the Andrew Sabold mobile app challenge at the 2010 CTIA wireless convention in Las Vegas last month. So they're out there in the market uh, doing real things. Michael, you might have noticed, completed a full spin cycle workout as a kind of prelim to our presentations. And I hope you all had a chance to, to check that out. Um, according to Michael, it's the first recorded live demo of an iPad fitness app. And uh, we're, we're proud, to, proud to have been the sponsor for that. Um, how that presentation came about is kind of funny. When we asked Michael to participate tonight. We mentioned that while Dr. Maragani was driving up from San Diego and uh, David here was driving down from San Francisco, Michael was lucky because uh, being based in Santa Barbara, he didn't have to come very far. Well, Michael, who had gotten off his spin cycle to answer the phone, uh, thought we said he should come as you are. <laughs> so, well, how about a nice hand for Michael on this workout? Uh, I'd like everyone to know that we will have a audience Q&A following the presentations and panel discussions, so please hold your questions until then. And on that note, I would like to invite uh, Dr. Maragani to the, the uh, lectern, and uh, how about a hand from Dr. Laragani. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Hello, everyone. Thanks for inviting me. It's an honor to be here and tell you about uh, wireless health, more particularly about the pervasive technologies that will transform healthcare. Um, let me see, the clicker works. You're familiar already with these pervasive technologies, uh, at least three of them. They've already affected your life uh, tremendously. Wireless connectivity, you take it everywhere you go, you depend on it. Cloud computing, much of the data, your online banking, many other things that you do online or on your wireless phone reside somewhere in the cloud. Cloud is essentially these farms of servers that are managed by specialty companies. Uh, you may think of them as unsecure, but actually they're probably the most secure of anywhere because these companies specialize in, in management of the uh, cloud resources and security is one of the key issues. Probably most everything will migrate to the cloud in the future. Another analogy to uh, give you a perspective of why the cloud is interesting is think of your uh, utility, electric utility. As you use equipment in your home, you draw more. If you turn them off, you draw less. Imagine if you had, everyone had an engine at home that generated electricity. Management of it is not easy. Scaling is an issue. But everyone can tap into the grid and draw the power that they need at the time they need it and pay for it as they need it. 
cloud computing essentially does that with the computing power. Uh, and finally, social networks, very critical in today's life. Many of you already use Facebook. My family keeps telling me to get on Facebook, and I'm afraid to get on there because it'd be just one more set of people that want attention from me. Uh, they say, no, you can be a passive bystander, but there's no such thing. If you're a passive bystander in Facebook, then essentially no one interacts with you, and that kills the purpose. Uh, so the, the other one that's often transparent, uh, that, that's often opaque to you, or is kind of like Intel Insight, our ubiquitous sensing. Uh, you would be surprised how much sensing surrounds you. Uh, automobile is a very good example. Increasingly, a, a substantial part of the cost of an automobile is the electronics and sensors. That that cost component has been going up over the last decade. Uh, and much of your uh, anti-lock braking systems, the airbags, the stability control, all of those run from data that comes from sensors. Now imagine if there are sensors in your environment or you're wearing them or they're implanted in you where data is being streamed from the sensors wirelessly because you want to be mobile, you want to garner all the benefits of mobility that wireless connectivity and computing brings to you. That data goes somewhere, eventually gets to the cloud. Analytics are done. Uh, insight is derived from the data, and one can determine actionable items that can go to the healthcare provider or to the patient. And then you wonder what are, wh why social networks? In many of the, the chronic diseases, it's not just uh, sufficient to tell a diabetes patient, okay, this was your uh, reading today, or this was your reading you know, 10 times today, and the physician says, you send that data to the physician, and the physician says, oh, you know, you've been bad today, you, your readings are off. You essentially have to create a social network in my case, my social network for my health is my mother-in-law. She gets all the lab results and gets after me. Your cholesterol is too high, your blood pressure is this. And that social network can play a critical role. In fact, overseas, you see some of the advertisements for, for these wireless glucometers that enable you to, to send the data right away. After a reading, go, uh, the advertisement show how this data goes to your family and they rush to your help. So that's how the social networking fits in. And there will probably be more pervasive technologies that will come around, but, but these will impact healthcare in ways that, that are transformational. What is this transformation? We're used to showing up for, for our healthcare needs to a clinic or a hospital. At a certain time, we get an appointment. The doctor sort of goes through a, a regimen and gives us some prescription. These prescriptions are based on drugs or, or uh, uh, regimens that are derived from population type of studies or developments. And it happens reactively. It happens after we feel either we need to go to the hospital or it happens after something major takes place. But imagine wireless uh, monitoring of patients, so chronic disease, for example. You can be monitored anywhere, anytime. If you couple genomics to the wireless monitoring or to the sensor monitoring, the um, Healthcare can be individualized, so you're looking at a particular person, and if, you, if doing the genome is cheap enough, you've already identified the risk factors that this person faces, and you can monitor them for those risk factors. Therefore, the healthcare can be preventative. So what we believe will happen over time, healthcare will move to individualized preventative medicine that's infrastructure independent where infrastructure is a clinic or a hospital. I'm going to give you an example of how this uh, can work uh, using a smart patch uh, as an as example. Uh, 
I will show you later in the presentation uh, examples of smart patches that are being used for a variety of applications such as heart failure, heart rhythm, daily calorie intake. This one, the video that I'll show you is a smart patch for sleep uh, monitoring and sleep diagnostics. In fact, the technology exists today to eliminate a sleep lab. And it's just a matter of time, perhaps a matter of this, uh, dislodging the existing business models. Uh, sleep labs make a lot of money in hospitals. Uh, the doctors connected to the sleep labs would be very adamant that nothing replaces doing a, a study in a sleep lab in a hospital. So about 40 million people suffer from sleep disorders. In this case, the example is Kelly that's having rest, rest, restless sleep. Uh, so she gets up, she has this smart band-aid essentially that she can take out and place it on her temple to monitor her sleep patterns. Uh, the technology is not there yet to, to make these uh, smart patches inexpensive enough and small enough with a broadband radio to send the data directly to the cloud. So what happens is there's usually a gateway nearby. The gateway can be your cell phone, which the data from the sensor comes to the gateway and then gets transmitted to the cloud. Or in this case, the gateway can be something that, that sits on the nightstand. The data comes to the gateway and then gets transmitted. When this takes place over a few nights, uh, the data gets uploaded. Eventually, the doctor can, the healthcare provider can look at the data from uh, a number of nights and then diagnose that she has a sleep disorder and therefore move forward with the right regimen of treatment. Uh, if you didn't have this capability, she would have to go to a sleep lab, be in place, for the study to, uh, to be done. This is an example of what is possible with wireless health, and I'll give you examples of a number of these uh, smart patches later in the presentation. So, so the idea for wireless health is to offer the opportunity for creating a new infrastructure independent model of healthcare that lowers costs, be patient-centric, and improve outcomes. Those are the key phrases, lower cost, patient-centric, and improve outcomes. So let me talk about a little bit about state of healthcare. Uh, problem, rising costs. Uh, as you look from 1965 about to now, healthcare costs, uh, healthcare expenditures have risen tremendously, over 2.3 trillion in 2008. It breaks down as Medicare, and Medicaid, essentially federal programs, private insurance programs. Other is DOD and Veterans Affairs, and then the deductibles and co-pays from the patients. Clearly, this cost pattern is not sustainable. Another way of looking at it is that per capita expenditure on healthcare in the U.S. compared to other countries is, is about twice as much, about $7,000. Uh, so again, healthcare is, is expensive. You can argue that the outcome is great or is not great. That's a, uh, that's a separate issue. 75% of the healthcare go dollars go to patients with one or more chronic disease conditions. Diabetes, obesity, heart failure, high blood pressure, lung disease are, are some of the examples. Uh, so there's, if one could do monitoring to keep the patients out of the hospital, improve their quality of life because they can go about their daily living, it would tremendously help with the cost of chronic diseases. It helps the patient maintain their health status, and it also additionally provides the opportunity to expand healthcare to remote areas where physicians may not be available. Uh, by way of example, in 2003, one of the studies showed that obesity-related medical expenditures alone are about $75 billion, and obesity has been increasing uh, since 2003. Uh, Michael makes the point, and if you visited him during his workout, he, ma he made the point that the patients have to take responsibility 
for their health, it's very true. 40% of all chronic conditions can be attributed to behavior. Bad diet, lack of exercise, smoking, substance abuse, and it would be great if he tells you the story of how he got to, to the business that he's developing and promoting. And it's a perfect example of this 40%. In fact, you may be surprised to hear that in Japan they are establishing policies where you may not get coverage if you are not meeting certain criteria, for example, certain weight within your norm group, certain blood pressure. Uh, Qantas is thinking about changing the, the fare, charging more for people that are beyond the norm weight, uh, you know, beyond by some amount. So th these concepts in the U.S. are, are uh, a little bit difficult to, to uh, think about, but in the rest of the world, they're coming about. Uh, in fact, in Australia, there's quite a bit of TV advertisement, as I understand, on healthier eating. So the concept for wireless health is early intervention with the patient, be able to collect data. Again, these sensors could be in the living environment, where, worn by this uh, patient or implanted. And what's creating a lot of the excitement is that there is a lot that can be done without implanting sensors, without breaking the skin. And that, of course, makes it a lot easier to, to deploy the sensors. Once you have the data, that data can be looked at locally by the patient. It can be transmitted to be analyzed. So data is important. Analytics are important. Then the healthcare provider can look at actionable items. Healthcare providers already get a ton of data. They don't want more data. They want actionable information. So they want analytics done on the data, and they want to know what, what does that data mean. Then the support group and the healthcare provider can help the patient uh, through with uh, the next steps. Often many of that can be preventative. Then the question, why wireless? If you look at cell phone as an enabler, uh, there are about 750 million 3G mobile broadband subscribers today. That will be about 1.6 billion by 2012. Uh, the lesser capable phones, uh, there's a lot more of them. I think the total number of cell phones about 4 billion. Couple of comparisons that makes this stark. There are more cell phones than toothbrushes in the world. There are more people with cell phones in the world than people with, uh, with clean water. So that tells you how much of an enabler a cell phone can be. Now imagine, again, imagine that this is not necessarily uh, a proven technology, but one can sort of have a leap of faith. If everyone could sneeze or cough into their cell phone and get a diagnosis of their respiratory illness, you know, this is about having large data banks of this uh, type of information and the right algorithms to go with it. And maybe you could sneeze into your phone and then essentially get a diagnosis. So the origin of wireless health is wireless health is not new. It's been practiced over the last 10 years, mostly in emerging markets such as India, Kenya, South Africa. Again, this is not surprising. You're in regions where healthcare providers are not available, but the population needs uh, healthcare. And so you use the wireless connectivity that, uh, that exists in these remote regions uh, to, to get the healthcare uh, information to, to the population. The, the ways in which cell phones have been used uh, in, in these emerging markets are essentially diagnosis and treatment support, the, the healthcare provider having a cell phone at the point of care and being able to describe or send a picture of a wound and get information back, get support back. Remote monitoring, essentially maintaining appointments or ensuring medication adherence with the patients, remote data collection where the healthcare professional is in the village and can actually enter data uh, while seeing the patient. And very importantly, SMS or instant messaging. 
Instant messaging can be a powerful tool to get information to the patient or get information back from the patient. Uh, the White House in January launched this project, uh, Text for Babies, or Text for Babies, the actual project. And the idea is that pregnant mothers can register and during the course of their pregnancy can receive text messages with instructions of how best to care for themselves, care for the baby. Now imagine, and this, this is not hard because it's already demonstrated, that you can essentially put a, a, a column, optical column, on the back of your cell phone uh, camera chip and have a microscope slide in which you can look at a blood sample or a urine sample and actually take a picture and send that picture somewhere to be looked at. On the other hand, uh, you, you've probably seen the GEV scan, which is a handheld mobile ultrasound. There was a lot of commercial of this in the, uh, during the Winter Olympics in Healthy Imagination commercials from GE. It's not at all, at all hard to imagine, and this is coming, where in this example, a cell phone would be integrated into the imager. So you take the image and you can send the image. In the previous example, you saw that the, the imaging device was integrated into the cell phone. So again, mobility is, bring, is bringing ability to do a lot of diagnosis that otherwise wasn't possible uh, to, to remote areas, to the point of care, and many of these can eventually be worn by the patients or be in their, their home environment. Uh, there is a study that says by 2014, there will be about 400 million devices that will work, for, uh, that will be variable wireless sensors, essentially. Uh, many of these uh, will be biosensors. A lot of the electrical measurements are already being developed and probably will be deployed in the next five years. And then the next sort of challenge is what are the type of biomeasurements that one can do? It's a great field for bioengineers. But you can have smart patches that measure your ECG, measure respiration rate, measure heart rate. Uh, you already know of pedometers that measure your activity. Uh, smart pills, I'll show you examples of these. So essentially, any device that you can get that, that is wearable, or in your environment, wirelessly connects to somewhere in the cloud that sends the data to your healthcare provider, does the analytics on it. Uh, our chief medical officer, Dr. Eric Topol, has, has developed a list of 10 targets for wireless medicine. These are chronic diseases, alphabetically listed, but some of the, the ones that you're well familiar with, asthma and COPD, about 33 million people affected. Uh, diabetes, 24 million. Hypertension, 74 million. Obesity, 80 million. Sleep disorders, 40 million. And the, the idea is that if you could monitor these parameters continuously with these chronic patients, then you'll be able to help them manage their disease better. In many of these chronic disease cases, they can't get rid of the chronic disease, but they can get what I call to a new normal by managing their, their disease. Uh, there was a study that was done in 2008 that showed the ability to save with remote monitoring, uh, looking at three examples, congestive heart failure, diabetes, uh, COPD. And the idea is that monitoring allows you to keep people out of the hospital, out of nursing homes, they can, they can essentially age in place, and that together saves a substantial amount of sum from the healthcare system. Let me give you some wireless health application examples. Uh, I showed you the video for, for sleep monitoring. In fact, there is a consumer device. It's actually a fairly sophisticated medical device, but it was brought to the, by the company directly to the consumer and positioned as a consumer device by making no medical claims. And what it is, is instead of a patch, there is a headband that you wear when, before you go to sleep. There is a little uh, device here in the headband 
that uh, has three electrodes to measure your EEG, your brain waves, and from that, they run analytics and determine what, si what where in your sleep patterns you are. In the morning, you'll actually get uh, the data, when you went to bed, when you got up, uh, what your uh, Z-score is, essentially, uh, sort of how well did you sleep, and they also graph the, uh, what, how long did you get deep sleep versus REM sleep, how long were you awake, and you can get a pretty decent graph that, that versus time, this is from 10 p.m. to 6 a.m., that says, you know, when you were awake, when you were in deep sleep, when you were in light sleep, and you can analyze this, then they give you some coaching. You can go upload the data to their website, and they'll tell you things like, you know, don't drink coffee three hours before you go to bed, don't answer your emails or look at your emails two hours before you go to bed. So there's one piece of this that's missing, and that's the therapy. But at least there is a piece that's making the, the consumer aware of their sleep quality. Okay? Now, there's an interesting feature from this. You, they can also help you sort of uh, be woken up by your alarm clock. In this case, the gateway, which is here, is also an alarm clock. And it can sort of wake you up when in an optimal time, maybe when you're in light sleep or REM sleep, but not when you're in deep sleep. There's another simpler app that you can run on an iPhone. Essentially, you can put the iPhone under your pillow, and uh, it will, from, from uh, your movement, actually, can, can detect your sleep pattern, and then you can set the clock on the iPhone or uh, to wake you up again in an optimal time. Or you can record the sound of your snoring, actually, and from that sound analysis, you can also tell about the sleep patterns. So imagine now multi-analytics. If you have the Zio Sleep Coach, it tells you what your sleep patterns are, and then your partner has the, the iPhone app, so it records that you're snoring, and you can tie the two, that I was awake because you were snoring really loud during this period of time, so you can't deny it. Or think about the social network. So Meron has this uh, Zio Sleep Coach, and this data gets uploaded and gets sent to my social network, could be my office mates. And they know I got a bad night of sleep, so I'm gonna be grumpy that morning. So avoid Meron or you know, be a little bit more tolerant because he didn't get good sleep last night. Uh, there are uh, smart patches that are coming around that essentially do vital signs. This is an example of one. And yeah, it's a little bit clunky right now, but they will shrink fairly quickly. You've had that experience with many electronic devices. In this case, you can do ECG, you can do heart rate, you can do respiratory rate. Uh, most of them have an exorometer in them so that you can do motion analysis uh, to see if you're sitting, standing, sleeping, or you can also back out activity from that. Uh, so you can do real-time monitoring, and the data will go from this patch wirelessly to the gateway. Again, the gateway could be a specific device like this Zio Sleep Coach example you saw, or it can be the um, it can be your cell phone. This is example from a company called Ventus that's developing again another one of these smart patches. This smart patch has a number of sensors in it can be used to record for arrhythmias. Again, from the patch, the data goes to a gateway, and from the gateway, it gets transmitted to the monitoring station, and from there to the physician, uh, if there is a need for the physician to see the data. It can also be used for heart failure, and the way it's done is with bioimpedance measurements to look at fluid retention and essentially detect if you're in danger and you need to be given a diuretic, for example. There's another company, uh, Philometron, that's developing a patch. Uh, it's not unlike the one from Corventus. It's a bioimpedance type of measurement to look at tissue composition 
and try to correlate directly a calorie count with what you're eating real time so that as you're eating, it can count the calories that you're taking in. Uh, you already have seen a lot of devices that, that me measure calorie expenditure. So if you can calculate calorie intake directly, then you really have something. The challenge with all these smart patches are, uh, is the following. You want them to be unobtrusive in the case of the variables, so the patient puts it on and forgets about it. So in, for that, you have to make it small. As you make it small, power and data rate becomes an issue. So you have to go to ultra-low power electronics to make the battery last. You also have to match the application with the data rate. If, if the data rate is very high and it's continuous, well, that makes the life of the battery shorter. So there are trade-offs between the size, power, and data rate. Then you have to worry about security. The data has to remain private. You have to know who the data is coming from, okay? And flexible deployment of these sensors, especially for the multi-sensor applications. One of the uh, biggest challenges in healthcare is uh, medication compliance. Uh, it, it, it is not uh, good at all. And in fact, more than half half of the patients stop taking their medication after I think six months it is. And so medication compliance is a big issue and you may be surprised to know that companies are developing small sensors that can get incorporated on a pill or in a pill. As you digest this pill, the sensors are activated. They're made of food ingredients. They're activated by the stomach fluids and they send us a, a signal to a patch that you would be wearing uh, to let the, uh, and that patch then transmits the signal so you can record that the pill was taken. And you may be able to add over time the ability to measure physiological parameters. So not only you know that the pill was taken, but then what happened physiologically. Another approach to this is a company by the name of Vitality. They're putting the sensors, the wireless communication, and the electronics in the cap of, of the pill bottle. And what that cap does, it, it glows and flashes, plays a ringtone when it's time for you to take your medication. It actually can call your cell phone or your home phone if you didn't come and open the cap and take, take your pill. Well, it doesn't detect taking the pill, but it does detect opening the cap. It can actually help order a refill when the right number of times the cap has been opened, or it can uh, send a message to a family member, for example, for elderly children who may be helping with, with the health care of the, the, their parents. It, it can actually send information to them if the person is taking their medication or not. And you can incentivize the physician and the patient with respect to medication compliance. Uh, I believe that the gateway for this uh, is, is now in AT&T stores or will be coming soon. So there will be a gateway nearby that you plug into the wall and the data from the cap goes to the gateway and then gets transmitted from the gateway. Uh, <clears throat> Airstrip is a very good example of a company that's providing the hospitals with the ability to get the uh, medical vital signs right off of the equipment and transmit it to the cell phone of the physicians. So in many of these examples that I gave you, uh, this uh, crystallizes it for you as where the doctor can essentially see the data. The doctor doesn't need to be tied to one place or a, or a given time. As they're moving around, they can actually monitor the patients. If I had one of these connected to a healthcare facility, I could be monitoring patients in ICU in Texas, for example. Another area of importance is aging in place. An example that I picked here is the eye shoe. I'm sure that Apple will sooner or later uh, sue them, and then you'll know that eye shoe is making a profit uh, for, for, for using eye shoe. But the idea here is to put sensors in the shoes. 
and be able to monitor gate and from the gate back out what the status of health of the elderly is, what's their balance, for example, as, as time goes on, is there a change in the balance? Uh, let me tell you about West Wireless Health Institute, where I'm from. Uh, the Institute is a non-for-profit medical research organization. It was launched uh, last year with a seed fund of 45 million, seed investment of 45 million by Gary and Mary West, a San Diego couple that are very passionate about reducing cost of healthcare and improving outcomes, and they feel wireless technologies or solutions have a chance to do that. The, mi the mission of the Institute is to improve patients' lives by acting as a catalyst for meaningful innovation that lowers healthcare costs and improves healthcare outcomes. And I gave you a number of examples of how you can imagine that happening. The Institute has a, an engineering, a clinical, and a policy initiative. Therefore, it will be doing innovation, it will be doing incubation of technologies and ideas, va clinical validation, health economics validation, policy advocacy to, to pave the way for wireless health to grow as a field, and commercialization, including investment in technologies that it develops or others are developing uh, that are valuable. Um, some of you in here are, I know, are from UC Santa Barbara. Uh, one way for uh, uh, your students to get involved with wireless health is to join us as postdoctoral fellows. It's a program we've launched, and we have a number of open slots. What's exciting? To conclude, is, is how these pervasive technologies are converging to change healthcare. The transformation that's coming is to go from a fixed place, designated time to anywhere, anytime, individualized and preventative medicine. Thanks for having me here. Thank you very much, Moran. That was wonderful. Appreciate it. Um, I will have to edit out that slide on uh, the snoring application before I share it with my wife, though. <laughs> um, you'd mentioned that social networks are considered critical to progress and adoption of, of, of some of these technologies um, as it relates to support groups and managing chronic disease and, and family members, um, you know, participating in, in healthcare. And I'd, I'd now like to introduce Christina Wallman, who uh, is uh, making progress in that area with uh, software as a service package. Um, her, her company has developed a product line known as Change Leader, and uh, I think Christina will uh, discuss that um, now. Thank you. So as I'm listening to Dr. Maragani, I'm starting to think of what Change Leader is as the last mile technology. We might be able to sense the heck out of everything and even be able to get ourselves to take a pill, but really, we need to get ourselves to change behavior. So what if it was your job to help 10,000 people change the way they behave? How would you do that? And then if I could give you a tool that allowed you to automatically instruct that population in a way that actually produced motivation inside of them, creating an accountability relationship between them and yourself, the leader of their change, and them and one another, would that be helpful to you? And essentially, that's what Change Leader is about. And we believe that all people whose job it is to lead behavior change in the future will need a way to connect, instruct, and hold their end user population accountable in order to be effective. They need to leverage technology to produce motivation in the individual. So Change Leader is essentially a tool for leaders in behavior change. If it is your business to help other people change their behavior, then this is a tool for you. And we bring content, delivery, and community together in a social networking, software as a service packaged application that is designed specifically to compel action in the end user. And if it's your job to get your end user population to take action, this is a tool that you'll need. So this slide kind of sums it up conceptually. So have you ever known anybody who set a New Year's resolution? Or have you ever set one yourself? 
if you've tried to change behavior alone, maybe some of you even right now know a behavior that you need to change, consuming a little too much Diet Coke, eating a few too many calories, we all have them. But when we try to change alone, for most of us, it's really difficult. And when we pay an expert, actually we get better results. Because, of course, if your personal trainer is expecting to see you that day, you're gonna show up. And once you're there with them, you're doing it together. So people are more successful. Stop paying your expert, go back to getting your results of having done it alone. And there's some research that shows if you have a peer group that you check in with once a week and you state your goal in front of that peer group, then you're actually one third more likely to follow through with the behavior. So what Change Leader provides is this combination of your expert and your peer accountability group, but instead of a once a week check-in, it's all day long accountability and support. So who's a change leader? Well, this is Kevin. Kevin runs a set of, a franchise of fitness centers, and it's his job to get people excited and motivated about doing exercise. That's the behavior he's going after. And the reason he's going after it is he wants you to be happy that you spent your money on that gym membership. He wants you to perceive value in that. He's a change leader. He's leading you in behavior change. Who else is a change leader? This is Jaina. She's responsible for corporate wellness at her company. She makes sure there's a, a fitness assessment for all of you, that you have discounted gym memberships, that there's um, an email campaign about healthy behaviors, things of that nature. Who else? This is Craig. Craig runs a personal development business. He's actually not in the health field, but he's still leading other people in behavior change. He helps you achieve financial success. He runs seminars. He helps you achieve relationship success. He does public speaking. He writes books. He wants you to be successful in your relationships, in your money, in your career, things of that nature. Who else? Karen. Karen leads a weight loss program. She has a curriculum, and she's trained other people to deliver her curriculum to help form support groups so that people can lose weight. And she even has her own line of packaged foods. So basically what I'm saying here is all of these different kind of people have the job of helping other people change their behavior. And they're all aiming to deliver maximum success to their end user population. They want to extend their reach as far as it can possibly go. Their business model performs better if it's beyond one-to-one. -one. They want to go one-to as far as they can possibly go, and they want to produce the maximum success that they can to keep people coming back. So what is a social networking tool specifically designed to enable behavior change? It consists of these five components. One, automated instruction done in a way that actually induces motivation. It's got to be bite-sized. It's got to be actionable. And there's an intersection between that automated instruction and the content. And in, in this case, actually, it can be our content. We have our own content that we put through this pipe, OK? But it could also be your content. You, as the change leader, might have your own curriculum of change that you want to put through this. Or it could even be a third party's content. But the content and the instruction has to come together in a really specific way that actually induces motivation. And that's part of the, the service aspect of this software as a service to help you actually translate your content to make it meaningful and actionable and motivating so that people follow through. And then you want to create a social experience. And Dr. Maragani referred to this in funny ways. But you want to create a social experience around your shared objective. So if you're following an expert, uh, your change leader, then you are obviously uh, you have a social objective. And so does everybody else that's following that change leader. And to bring you together and socially network and connect around the shared objective is important. And then, of course, there's tracking. Are you following through with the behaviors? And there's accountability between you and your peers and between you and your change leader. So OK, now we're going to go ahead and click. We're going to see this thing in action. Now, I wanted to give you a screenshot, but my husband said, no, no, you must do a live demo. So I'm taking that risk. Here I go. They're on a limited free trial right now. And their goal is to bring wellness to their employee population. So just to show you from an end user perspective what this is like. So up here, you're going to see these are the people that are in the organization. And maybe you can control this. You have to look up here to know where the mouse is on there, OK? So if you scroll over one of the people, you'll just see a little bit of information about them. I'm seeing, um, well, you're 
pointing to, you're getting information on him, but pointing to her, but you know, basically you're still seeing the person's name, you're seeing what program they're in, you're seeing how many tasks within their program that they have completed. Um, so it just gives you a sense that this scrolls either direction, um, and if I were to click on a person, but don't, um, you would go to their profile, because it'll lengthen this. It'll, you would go to their profile and you'd get statistics about their behavior. You would see by week and day and month how they're following through. And then I'm gonna come back over here and scroll down, okay? And now you can see sort of the heart of this, this is their task list. These are actionable bite-sized pieces, things that people need to do that they're going to be held accountable for. And I'll just, um, our, we're delivering content in three categories in this instance. We're delivering content in fitness, we're delivering content in nourishing food, and we're delivering content in relaxation training, reducing stress. Okay, so, but you imagine this with any kind of content. It doesn't have to be this content. And of course, um, we, we want it to be a variety of content, but here's a little, just sample, it opens up. I could play a little video here. In this case, it's a guided meditation that will take exactly two minutes. And you're told, if you look up here, how long this whole thing's gonna take. This is gonna take me three minutes. I have one day to do it. Here's exactly what I need to do. Push play, I can go into relaxation training. In this case, it, it has powerful suggestions in it that when you have completed it, you'll go back to your day and be productive. And when you're done, I'm gonna click done here. And you'll see I get a little, what we call a digital incentive if it'll take, you rock. It's, a, it's just a little <laughs> way to celebrate what you've done, but what you couldn't see, and I, so I'm gonna click it up here, is my percentage participation is actually gonna dynamically move. So you're seeing now, as I click done, I went from 42% participation up to 45% participation, and we, we're basically tracking within a social network how people are doing compared to one another. And we're not only tracking their percentage participation, but we also track how many programs they complete. So as I complete my nourishing food program, I get a little icon that's a raspberry that acknowledges that. And as I complete a fitness program, I get a little dumbbell that lands up there in my percentage participation bar. Um, you can also imagine this percentage participation bar being joined with biosensed information from people that is shared within a social network, which Dr. Maragani referred to earlier. I showed you the end user perspective. Now I would like to show you the change leader's perspective. If you're the person guiding other people in behavior change, what do you want to look at? You want to see how many active users do I have on the system? How many of those people just became recently inactive? And that's a configurable feature. How many people got, became inactive, didn't participate at all within the last two days or the last seven days? I would click immediately on that button. Who became inactive? And I would want to know why. What are the characteristics of the inactive people? What programs are they in? Do they not have friends in the system? Have they friended anyone? What departments in my organization are they in? Why are, not, why are they not following through? And what are the characteristics of the active people? And I want to know that, and I want to try to connect those people with each other. I also might want to know, how are people responding over time? So if people within my wellness program, in this case, happen to be waning in attention and motivation after they've been involved for five months, and that's just what's typical, the response rate over time, perhaps, in this instance, is going down at month five, then I can really look at that. What do I need to do in my organization to re-inspire people at month five? And I can really get a sense of how to insert myself as the change leader in order to help motivation stay high so that people are successful in the long term. Also on my dashboard, you can see here, I'm getting real-time input of what's going on in my network. So it gives me a chance to communicate with people. If I know that Jane just completed her static lunge, I have a chance to actually click right there and send her some personalized motivation. And I will tell you, when it comes to behavior change, people actually care quite a bit that other people are watching. And if someone has hired you to pay attention and help them change, then they really care that you care about what they're doing. They want to know that you're involved with them. And this sets you up to be a very active, involved leader for a massive quantity of people. And then, of course, you can see some buttons here. You can create the programs, work on your program content here, add users, create groups, and things of that sort. So the NIH, the National Institute of Health, has named social networking as a platform that can transform behavior. And it's interesting, actually, that the National Institute of Health has named behavior change science as one of its roadmap activities for the future. So why do you believe that the NIH thinks behavior change and understanding it is so critically important right now. 
When they had their big meeting in June, one of the outcomes was that there is this technology, social networking, that actually is very, very powerful. And we can see the power of social networks if we look at it another way. And a lot of you have probably read Connected, the book by Fowler and Christakis, I think is how you say his name. And, and in that book, they talk about their research that was later published in the New England Journal of Medicine. And, and the summary of that, and it was on the news, you probably saw it, was that obesity is contagious. Right, so why is obesity contagious? And they looked at 12,000 people over a period of 32 years, and they found that if one of your friends in your network becomes obese, you're 57% more likely to become obese. And the reason is because social networks are actually very powerful. We influence one another tremendously, whether we know it or not. And so this concept, our concept with Change Leader is to really turn that on the, its head. The social networking impact is natural, but let's take it and look at it another way. Let's be very intentional about it. Let's employ a social network and insert health behaviors and let those health, beha health behaviors have the ripple out effect in the positive direction. Additionally, when you couple that, that power of a social network with what we know about persuasive technology, we get an even more powerful tool. So, this is a book by a gentleman named B.J. Fogg. He's at Stanford University, and he is a leading researcher in something that they call captology. And captology is a study of how you use computer to influence people's behaviors. And three important elements stand out to me, and one of those is you need to use technology to make content simple. And if you've ever spent any time on the internet looking up diet or fitness, you'll know that the content out there is anything but simple. It's absolutely overwhelming. I've signed up for a lot of different newsletters and things myself, and I am interested in this topic, and I glaze instantaneously. So simplifying things is really important. And the reason it's so important to persuade people to take action is because of the benefit-cost ratio. You want to improve that ratio. You want to allow people to feel like the benefit I'm going to get from doing this outweighs the cost that it's going to require of me to do it. And once people can believe that that benefit-cost ratio is good enough and they follow through on the behavior, something happens. They become more likely to follow through on the next behavior. And when they do that a couple times, it becomes a virtuous cycle. Another element of persuasive technology is digital incentives. And you saw that. We give little points, we have a percent participation bar, we, we have different ways of incentivizing with um, some, some digital experiences. And incentives are really interesting right now because especially in corporate wellness, it's huge to pay people right now to lose weight or to stop smoking. Paying people to follow through on their health behavior is very popular right now. And that's interesting to me because the gentler the incentive is, the longer lasting the behavior change will be. So actually for long term wellness, we need the motivation to come from inside, not so much from outside. Another element of persuasive technology is that it needs to allow for timely suggestion. So you want to instruct people at a moment in time where they can actually take action on something, then they're much more likely to follow through with it. And again, we're set up within Change Leader to allow those who lead others in behavior change to insert their voice in a really timely way, at timely moments when they can actually make a difference. Okay, so it's the combination of persuasive technology meets the, the natural power of social networking. And, and social networking is powerful, and BJ Dog, Fogg talks about it too. It's because there's something called um, group level intrinsic motivators. It's, it's internal motivation. It's natural. When we put people together in a group, we behave differently. I actually care about your opinion of me, and I will perform for you. It's amazing, and we will compete with one another. We're naturally competitive. So it just brings out this natural inspiration inside of us when you put this kind of behavior transformation inside of an intentional social networking context. Okay, so who is buying change leader? Fitness centers and corporate wellness right now. And what these slides show are the sizes of these markets and what we think we can do with them. But essentially, fitness centers are a $16 billion market, and they spend about 5% on information technology. And this shows that we feel that in the future, and I'll tell you why in a second, they're going to spend at least 20% of that 5% on social networking solutions. And we think we can get 20% of that, which is $32 million. And then the corporate wellness market, it's interesting. The US study on corporate wellness says it's 
currently a $4 billion market, but has the capability to be a $14 billion market. And so how do they calculate that? And they emphasize it's a ballpark figure, but nonetheless, um, if a company is about 4,000 people or greater, then the average dollars that uh, is spent on healthcare is $135 per employee per year. So if we actually had all companies who employ people spending $135 per employee per year, it would be a $14 billion market. Now, not all companies are doing that, but the story is, which is important, these are large markets. So, okay, what, what's driving fitness centers to be interested in this? Uh, I will tell you, they care about two things, uh, acquiring and retaining customers, that their whole business model, acquisition and retention, it's all about that. But they know that their industry is changing and a recent white paper came out called The Future of Fitness that describes how their industry is changing. And, and you'll see this evidence if you think about it. People care more about connecting with others with a common goal than they do about location anymore when it comes to fitness. And that's why you're seeing all these boot camps around, right? Because I'll meet you at the stadium, I'll meet you at the park. I don't care if you have a cool facility or even cool equipment. I want to be with people who share my common purpose. And another thing that their research demonstrated was that people expect to use their technology in their fitness routine nowadays. And they expect to leverage online resources. And they also expect to be involved in programs that reach one program reaching over vast distances and in several places simultaneously. So this population, this is pretty intuitive if you think about it, but the end user population for fitness clubs totally is expecting a, a social online experience and fitness centers are aware of this. So they, they know they have a problem, they have a budget for a problem and they're seeking a solution. And so we're very happy about that. For all of the debate lately, one basic fact about America's healthcare crisis is rarely mentioned. I love this. Namely, that one thing that can really reform healthcare is you, collectively speaking, people living healthier lives. And consider this, nearly one in every four dollars that you spend on employee health care is related to behavior. And you talked about this again. It's a preventable. What is preventable? About 40% of the health care costs, I think is what you were saying, is related to behavior related um, illnesses. So now, you know, we have this new focus on preventative versus reactive health care, and there's a greater acceptance now of corporate wellness programs as a way to prevent disease and lower health care costs. So in the area of corporate wellness, we're finding that companies launch a corporate wellness program for, for two reasons. They want to save money, and they want to increase productivity. That's obvious. You will save money. So there's a lot of research on this for corporate wellness. You will actually save money. You'll save at least $2 for every $1 you put into corporate wellness can be saved, but it takes about three years, okay, for it to show up in your healthcare costs if you implement an effective, comprehensive program. But the gain is immediate, actually, in terms of productivity. And if you just reflect on this for a moment, you'll know it's true because healthier people in general are happier people in general, and they're more productive. They pr provide better customer service. They're more collaborative in meetings. And it's all been studied and documented. But intuitively, you know this is true. So in terms of corporate wellness, a, a comprehensive package includes four things. It's a population-based assessment, and then a population-based uh, awareness campaign, some online tools, you know, they distribute information, and then some personal coaching. And where we play is not in an online assessment or a, a population-based assessment. We don't have assessment tools. We're not about assessment. But we definitely are a major part of population-based awareness. We are the online tool, or we can play nice with other online tools. And we facilitate the success of the personal coaching. And a major driver for success in corporate wellness is engagement drive engagement. I mean, the best practice, they write about this, drive engagement. It cannot be said enough because the truth is, it doesn't matter, people don't actually do something. And so how do you drive engagement? Well, there's three pillars of engagement that they talk about. You enroll the corporate leadership and you make it a pervasive part of the culture inside of the company. And then you give a menu of different activities that people can do based on their readiness to change or based on their risk. And then you support the entire population as a whole. And change leader plays a role in all of those things. You're enrolling from the leadership because you're actually putting the company in a position to take not only a leadership role in their business, but a leadership role in their health. And you're supporting the entire population because this will transform your culture. If you 
put this into a company and you suddenly have people in meetings taking, doing their one minute wall squat while you're talking, over time, things just start to change. People behave differently and you are changing the culture. So we, we affect all of that. But in addition, there's something called the participation cascade that is part of measuring the effectiveness of corporate wellness programs that is recommended by WellCo. It's, the, it's you know, the leading organization in analyzing corporate wellness um, activities. And the participation cascade is about measuring follow through on the actions in a program until completion and measuring at the behavioral unit level. And that's exactly what, what Change Leader is about. It's about measuring at the behavioral unit level. So, okay, there are also other change markets. People spend money to change behavior, so not only in fitness and in corporate wellness, but diet is a huge industry. Personal growth, another large multi-billion dollar industry. Spiritual development, another one. Collectively, I call this the change industry, and it's greater than a hundred billion dollar industry. How do we deliver this? We have two ways we look at it. A standard version, which is basically off the shelf. It's brandable for you. You can plug our content into it. There's social tracking. It's ready to go. You can have it tomorrow. Then there's an enterprise version, and this has different levels based on how much service you want. But essentially, it's your customized content that we work with you to integrate into the system so it's very meaningful and impactful. It's the administrator's dashboard feature set that I showed you. It's social tracking and reporting. And then it's either your voice as the change leader, or if you'd like to pay a little bit more, it's our voice to take you all the way through. I have been blessed with an outstanding team. So uh, Rodney Lynch is our CFO. He's out of Barclays uh, in the East Coast. He's a superstar at you know, financial forecasting, business modeling, pricing, et cetera. Roland Roberts, a leading salesperson formerly with BombGuard, which is a remote access software company. Um, a sought-after speaker and sales trainer. Aaron Campos is a known local Ruby on Rails devel developer. Um, Randall Koff is here, an experienced product manager and uh, the person who probably gets leaned on the most to do the widest variety of things in our company. Maria Still Murphy is an expert in diet. People who are not on this slide is Chris O'Leary Hayes, who's an expert in fitness, a Pilates instructor and a PT trained assistant, and also um, Marie Janice, who is an expert in stress reduction content and creation. So finally, I'll just end with this thought for you, which is that all leaders in behavior change in the future will need a way to connect, instruct, and hold their end user population accountable within community. And change leader meets that need. Thanks. Thank you very much, Christina. I'm ready to change. Um, I, I'd like to take a couple of minutes. We, we have Michael Williams and David here also on the panel, and uh, there's a bio in our handout, but um, Michael and David, I'd, I'd like you to take a couple of minutes and just uh, talk about who you are, what you're doing, and, and so on, uh, to provide a little additional background on, uh, on, on you know, your sure. activities. Great. Um, David here, Acacia Venture Partners, we're up in San Francisco. Um, investing only in uh, healthcare services and healthcare IT. Um, we, we started back in 1995 with a focus on the services sector of healthcare. Everybody for a long time has uh, been investing in uh, the real exciting stuff like the biotech and medical devices and, and medical technology. Uh, we kind of uh, came into the less glamorous services side. Uh, where we don't have as many glamorous, um, um, huge successes, but not as many spectacular failures either. Um, you know, we, we look to do a, a healthcare service business that you know is, is a tweak or or some kind of a differentiated advantage in uh, this, this strategy or positioning in the marketplace to to gain. Um, market share and, and, and some examples that have worked out well for us. I'll give the ones that worked out the best. Uh, uh, our very first investment with our first fund was a Medicaid HMO. It sounds kind of boring, but you know, uh, you know, the, there was increasing interest in managing care for Medicaid because it was so, so such an out of control. Um, uh, cost area, uh, because Medicaid recipients don't have good access to health care, they end up in the emergency room a lot, and so by giving them a primary care doctor, giving them access to lower cost, um, 
uh, healthcare has really made a huge difference in, in, in the cost. One thing that's kind of interesting about it is uh, you can really do managed care. This is back in 1995 where they had HMOs that were supposedly doing managed care, but, you know, really were just, you know, charging money and then not really that interested in sp spending on a lot of preventative. But in, in Medicaid, there's four major diseases that account for most of the cost. Uh, one of those being high-risk pregnancies for, for teenage girls in particular. Um, and by getting in there early and managing that, you save a ton of money in uh, neonatal care by bringing that baby to term. Um, uh, you know, diabetes is another one of those. And by focusing on that, you know, and, and you, you, can do, you can do a lot of good. Uh, the competition was commercial HMOs that said, oh, sure, the getting's good, let's do some Medicaid too. But they didn't have the infrastructure, they didn't have the, the management of those specific conditions uh, to, to make a difference. Um, so, so that was, you know, now it's a New York Stock Exchange company. We backed it as a startup. Um, o over time, we started uh, investing in health IT companies as well, uh, especially in 1999, 2000, when that's all anybody wanted to uh, build businesses around in healthcare. Um, some of those have done okay, a lot of those have not done very well. Um, and I, you know, the time was really too early on uh, for that. Um, I think today it's just a real exciting area because I think the, uh, the te technology, the capabilities, the pace, especially you know, for the first time ever, so much um, political weight behind it uh, and just sort of an inevitability of acceptance that you know, a lot of healthcare providers are just going to have to you know, adopt some of these new ways of delivering healthcare and accepting you know, the computer as, as their friend uh, to help them develop uh, better health care. Along the way, we've done a little bit uh, in, in the um, more consumer-oriented areas, uh, the wellness. Um, and, and I think, uh, you know, we, we, we got probably burned a couple times in that area. Uh, we did an early sort of version, I think, of what Christina's doing now, um, but, but hers is much better. <laughs> Uh, we were early on with that, and um, uh, you know, the, the, the companies recognize that spending money on wellness has a payback. You know, whether it's two dollars for every dollar you spend or three dollars for every dollar you spend, there was that recognition, but they weren't sure how to do it and how to implement it. And so we had a company that um, uh, provided health risk assessments over the internet, and from there identifying you know areas to, to follow up on. Uh, smoking cessation and weight loss and that kind of a thing, um, but it was an opt-in. We got paid if you know the employee you know opted into this, but there really wasn't a concentrated um, employee wellness effort to kind of you know push push that forward. And also, we didn't have the uh, sort of personal accountability through the social network, which I think is is, is a great idea and a missing component. Um, so, you know, again, sort of all these things just are, are getting closer and closer uh, to, to where um, you can see that as, as a viable investment. The, the biggest enemy in um, investing in, in change in healthcare is how long it takes um, and, and getting the timing right. And so uh, there's great ideas out there, and um, if you get in uh, kind of at the right point in the curve, you know, that's when you're sitting pretty. But if you got in here and you just can't wait it out that long, that's when it's a problem. And, and sometimes the next guy comes along and you know, rides it the rest of the way and uh, thanks us for it, or we thank them for it. Um, but that's uh, probably, you know, timing your investment and, and trying to gauge when that uh, tipping point in the change is going to occur, uh, it tends to be the key. That's great, thank you. So I'm, I'm Michael Williams, uh, local here in town. Um, and I usually start off uh, in introducing my, my company um, by telling a personal story. And it's kind of funny, Christina mentions this uh, whole idea about obesity being socially contagious. And that, that actually uh, really started, um, started me off on, on my, my uh, endeavor here. Uh, three years ago, almost to the day, I was watching a five-part series on CBS News. And on Monday, they linked obesity to high blood pressure, Tuesday to high cholesterol, Wednesday to acid reflux, and Thursday to asthma. And on Friday, CBS News said that obesity is socially contagious, and if you're, so, if you're obese, there's not much you can do about it, and it's okay. And I looked at my wife and I said, that is not, not true. 
I can do something about it, and I'm going to. So talk about these ubiquitous sensors. I got a heart monitor, I got a weight, uh, weight scale, and I got a blood pressure cuff. And I decided I was going to drop 50 pounds, and I was going to get off all these meds. And I went and had a physical, and I told my doctor what my plans were, and he said, don't be discouraged. He said, it's probably genetic. You'll probably be on these meds for the rest of your life. And I said, I'll see you in seven months. Uh, I'm a recovering CPA, so I put together a <clears throat> uh, my own system of tracking everything because there wasn't anything out there um, for me. And I did it in Excel. And within the first month, I could see I, I'd lost 12 pounds. And I could see that there was a perfect correlation between my declining weight and my, my declining blood pressure. And at that point, there was no stopping me. Seven months after that physical, I came back to the doctor, exactly 50 pounds lighter. He looked at my, my blood work, couldn't believe his eyes, and he said, you're off all the meds. Together with my health care provider, I'm saving 25 grand a year, uh, 2,500 in my copay. So uh, after I completed that, and I realized that the hardest part of the whole thing was tracking it, um, I decided to start uh, my company, and we've just recently launched uh, the DigiFit ecosystem, and what we're all about is kind of connecting the dots between health and fitness. I started my career working for Allergan in, in healthcare, and then I spent the majority of my career in wireless. And just lately, I've, I've you know, really been immersed in, in fitness because I got healthy through fitness. Um, and you know, the funny thing is, is people in the healthcare industry never mention the F word, fitness. They're all about, you know, treating a, a particular condition, but not, not the, they don't really focus on the prevention or on the behavior change. And um, you know, it's pretty clear to me that, that what we really need to do is connect the dots between health and fitness. The healthcare industry needs to get people fit. Um, I, the year before at CTIA, I participated in a, in a wireless health uh, panel. And I, I called up the guy who was the uh, facilitator, and I told him I wanted to be on this panel, and I showed him what I was doing. He said, you know, Michael, that's great, but, but this panel's about wireless health. And I said, yeah. And he said, well, what you're doing is fitness. That's for athletes. I said, you know, that's the problem here. Two out of three Americans are overweight or obese. They're not moving. The people who are moving, the fitness people, they're OK. They're healthy. It's the people who aren't moving that we need to get out we need to get the health care. We need to start saying health and fitness in the same, in the same sentence. Um, and uh, we need to get our health care providers to encourage, motivate, and get us to get healthy through fitness. So that's what my company is all about. Um, uh, ITMP is the, the company, um, but our brand is uh, the DigiFit ecosystem. And um, we're really excited to try to help consumers take personal responsibility for their health. Great. Qu Question. How many calories did you burn on spin? Did you keep track? Uh, just well, everybody else was putting about four or five hundred in. I, I put about six hundred out. So right. I think net net, that's about a grand. Excellent. Okay. Um, I'd, I'd like to kick off a, a panel discussion with, with uh, an opening question, and, and please, all of you, feel free to to interject amongst each other. Um, it, and then we'll open the floor up for uh, audience question and answer. Um, the road to widespread adoption of personal health technology tools seems to be following two paths to me. Collaborative use between individuals and healthcare providers to monitor and treat specific health-related issues. And uh, secondly, by what appear to be mostly type A personalities intent on managing their physical condition in the greatest detail possible. Uh, Michael, you just mentioned you know connecting the dots. Um, one could argue that on the the institutional side, the the reduction of costs inherent in using technology to deliver and monitor care will they'll be self fulfilling. That's going to happen. Uh, the, the question becomes, how will players in this arena get the millions of individuals that could benefit from use of personal health technology tools, but that don't necessarily have an immediately pressing need for them to recognize the value to, and to embrace them um, and, and to get the dots connected so there's more of an awareness and, and adoption of these tools. Should I go? I, I want to, to follow up on Michael's uh, description. We, we have a cost-based fitness system 
and it really needs to move to a value-based wellness system. That's, that's really another way of what Michael was saying. Uh, but the, the question you put out is, is a tough one, and I, I think that at the end, there need to be um, holistic solutions that are based on new, new models and leverage a variety of uh, levers. Uh, I think we've talked about health, fitness, social networks. Uh, peer pressure is clearly a, a big uh, factor in, in driving people to healthier lifestyles, in driving people to, to adopt technology. So um, it may be that with the current sort of adult generation, it's going to be very difficult, but the, the younger generation already has technology in their lifestyle. Mm -hmm. And as the technologies become available to track, if, if we focus on the five, six, seven, eight year olds, uh, it may be easier to move them into a direction that, that will help the system down the road than try to really focus on the adults now. Uh, but again, peer pressure incentives play a big role. It's, there is, it's unquestionable if you live in Midwest uh, the, for, for a given category, the average weight is higher than if you live on the West Coast or the Midwest. Uh, it's a fact. Uh, and if airlines start charging more for people with, with weight that's beyond a certain limit, I think that'll start making you think. Um, if you look up, uh, walk up to Cheesecake Factory's counter, when you see that one slice of cheesecake is a thousand calories on average across all the cakes that they have there, it makes you think twice about eating. So I think information in itself is a key driver. I guess I think about it, um, you know, from the um, who, who's going to you know pay for the the service or the the approach. Um, and, and how long till that there's a payoff? And so, I mean, I, I couldn't agree more. You know, with you know needing to get the information out there, starting when the kids are young, and all that, um, and, and patient behavior being key. You know, I mean, nothing's going to change. You know, the cost of healthcare more, or the you know the health of a population than people changing their own behavior, um, as opposed to depending on the healthcare system for it. Um, and that, you know, it's hard to do. Um, that's why it hasn't happened yet. Um, so I guess from you know from the investor's perspective, um, we like to see who's going to pay for it. And I guess I'm going back to the beginning part of your question, Rick, um, about the collaborative versus the the individual. And you know even from an investment perspective, I have a sense that you know the individual market, those Type A guys or the millions of people, um, that's where the huge win is going to be for somebody. You know who can really understand the consumer market and figure that out. Um, I, you know, I, I, I feel that that's kind of hard to figure out. You know how to relate to the consumer if you're not you know, the Steve Jobs or the the Sergey Brins, the guys that kind of really nailed it, where everyone else you know hadn't gotten there. Um, so, I guess from an investor perspective, my comfort level is more with the, the value proposition for an organization, whether it's the the, the corporation. Uh, or, or a healthcare payer, somebody other than the individual paying for it um, that, that you can demonstrate the value to and, and then figure out how our prior company wasn't so good at getting people signed up for it, involved in it, and making it compelling enough. Um, um, but, but to partner with those, those companies, those organizations, with the, and figure out how to bring the doctor into it. Because one of the hardest things in all of this is, is, is paying the doctor for being involved here. Um, and, you know, there's Finally, some progress is being made there, but that's been one of the big stopping points. You know, when the, you can send all this information on the cell phone to your doctor, and the doctor's not going to want to pull out his cell phone and do much with it and spend the time on it, unless there's a mechanism for him to be compensated for it. And they should, because, you know, that's where you can prevent the, the, the more severe um, uh, expensive interventions. Um, but, but that would be our perspective is how, you know, how do you get to the person who's going to pay for it and make it, you know, compelling for them and for help them to help get the individual patients and consumers on board with it. Right. So um, in, in 2000, and, well, I should back up. Um, in, in 1995, I got into the wireless industry, and I think it was 96 when we started talking about smartphones and putting cameras in phones. and, and um, 
it really wasn't until the iPhone came out um, that smartphones really started exploding. And that's because Apple started with a really cool computer and then put an okay phone in it. Whereas we had people back in the, in the 90s who were making really good uh, mobile phones and trying to cram cameras and, and crappy computers into it. And so, so smartphones hit a tipping point with, with uh, Apple coming out. And I think it's still apples to oranges right now, but the other handset manufacturers are starting to catch up. Um, in 2008, there were 139 million smartphones sold. In 2010, there'll be two, uh, 295 million. And in 2012, 500 million smartphones sold. So now, if you, if you think about he health and fitness, I like to use the two words at the same time, um, and you think about these monitoring devices. Um, in 1977, Polar invented the first wireless EKG. At the time, the best mobile computing device was a digital watch. So that, was, that made the most sense to put this heart monitor into the, into the mobile computer. Um, and you look at bike computers, same kind of thing. Tiny little form factor, little LCDs, got to toggle around. You have to carry your user manual with you to figure out how to get through it. And, and I think making, making this kind of tracking, uh, getting the data to the places where you want to send it to, um, and and uh, connected networking and and uh, and and all will happen because everyone's going to have their computing device with them all the time because it's their smartphone. Finally, smartphones are taken off. So taking full advantage of that, and and I think basically, uh, you know, our mantra has always been: it has to be cool, fun, simple, and custom. If if it's not, and we started with, well, that's. You know, that was a good way to start with cool, is, is with Apple. Um, and uh, then making the whole experience auto-magically happen, so I don't have to input stuff, so I don't have to do anything except for just look at the results. So, so I think it's incumbent upon us to make it totally, ridiculously simple, really fun, really motivating, and, and I think it's, it's happening. We're, we are at the tipping point. People only change for two reasons, and one is fear of pain, and the other is desire for pleasure. So I have to agree with what Michael says, and either we'll collectively, emotionally associate with the current state of things as they truly are in relationship to our health condition in this country and our budget conditions, we'll actually bring it into our beings and resonate with it and feel that emotion, and or it will become so pleasurable and fun to play with our mobile devices that we'll become willing to take new action. Great, thank you. That, that was great feedback. Um, or both. I, I think uh, the emphasis on conditioning youth, there's an Xbox game in there somewhere. I don't know. <laughs> um, so I'd uh, like to open the floor up to uh, audience questions and answers, and uh, we'll address the panel. Hi, Christina. I was thinking about a couple things when you were talking. And I think really we're all sheep to a certain degree. And people that work for large corporations are aware of the what the CEO or the president or whatever it may be does. And I think if he gets on the internet, the intranet for the company, and said, I'm doing it, I would like you to do it, and here's what we'll give you for doing it. Because for the company I work for, they've said, do it, they put it in writing, we'll pay you 50 bucks. Well, they don't really, you know, keep track of who does and who doesn't. People are also aware of doing it. They're afraid of giving away information about themselves where they might not be insurable. But if they knew you were there and they knew that they could still participate and go from internal to an external program that was social, I would think there might be a way. Now, there was a gentleman I met here tonight that I, who probably has a monopoly on some of the major corporations of the world as far as intranet connections go. And he has contracts with the major studios and the major corporations for their inter and intranet uh, situations. And somebody like that could be of absolute value because he could put you in contact with him. And also, have you talked about working the teenage market, which is so socially active? and using the social side of it as far as content goes, which Dr. talked about, 
where they could be notified if the children are participating or doing what they're asked to do and have the parents pay them to do it, to lose weight and so forth, because we know what's happening. It is an absolute contagion. And uh, also maybe tax incentives for obesity or something for kids. You know, Thank I'll you. make one, one comment on that. The Y generation is outnumbering the baby boomers on the planet, and they live in their social network. So those people are going to become employed in our companies, and, and they're starting to be already. So communicating to that generation, you know, it needs to happen in their medium where they're comfortable. Um, I am interested in talking to you about your contact, and um, I don't know if I made this clear, but these social networks that we are deploying into organizations are private contained social networks. So um, it is um, only the community of that organization that is involved, unless they want to ex extend it beyond. Yeah. The people that participate within the company are part, or pardon me, are nervous sometime about letting the company know what is oh, wrong yes. with them. Right. But if they have an ability to go outside the company knowing you're there, that should be, they should be made of that, aware of that as well. Yeah, we're dealing with that with Stanford. There's HIPAA concerns and things of that nature. But what we're finding so far is um, what we're putting through our system is not um, this um, sensitive material. It's really taking the sensitive maybe material into account to uh, offer people a set of a menu of programs that re relate to that material, but it doesn't actually reveal that unless it's an opt-in by the in end user. Yeah, I just want to tack on a kind of a funny story. I was, uh, I was back in DC at, at a mobile health conference and um, really stood out like a sore thumb as a fitness person in this health world. Um, and, and I was talking to a, a, a publisher in, in the health space, and he, he was saying, Michael, you know, before I got into this, um, I was participating in a wellness program, and um, I, I joined the gym, and I, I actually was tracking like, like you were. I was tracking all my workouts, and I had this spreadsheet that showed all the time I spent at the gym and all the calories that I burned, and I brought it to HR department, and I said, here's my, here's my proof, you know, for my 300 bucks or whatever it was. And, and the HR person said, no, we need to see the receipt that you actually paid to join a gym. <laughs> and, and uh, you know, I was just, are you crazy? You know, um, one, of the, one of the major healthcare providers that, um, in, in the country, I was talking to them about uh, wellness programs, and they said, you know, we don't have any data to support the efficacy of wellness programs. Are you kidding me? And, and I, so I think things, things like what, what Christina is doing, I mean, you have to base it on, on, on data. In God we trust, everyone else bring data. I mean, you, it has to be data. And, and um, you, you know, I think that's going to be something that the wellness programs are going to have to get smart about how they do it, not just give some, oh, okay, I, I, I joined 24-Hour Fitness, cost me 200 bucks, I got 300 bucks, cool, now I can go eat bonbons. I mean, it just it doesn't make sense. <laughs> Hi, I have a question about the, um, I guess, social networking, because I think, Michael, you're, you're dealing with a group of people who are motivated to begin with, I think, and already buy into the technology and want to buy these things. But if you're signed up through a corporation, do you have any data that talks about the, I guess, sustainability, like, you know, you're real motivated at the beginning and your social network is really helping you stay on the wagon and, you know, is there a recidivism rate or do you fall off the wagon? like? How much incentive is is that? Does the social network provide long term? Because we're thinking about health for a lifetime. I, I can only give you anecdotal evidence just from what we've been doing. But what we know is the more the voice of the change leader comes through and communicates to that end user, as the more listening there is, the more long term the change is. The communication, the relationship, is really what's driving the behavior more than anything, but that relationship is facilitated by um, connecting around an action item to do and then the witnessing of that behavior that facilitates that communication It opens the door and it, that communication inspires the next action. I just want to tack on too that, that we're, we're working with people who are moving already but I want to put her, her peanut butter in, in my chocolate, right? I want, I, we, as we connect the dots between health and fitness, we need to do things like, like um, you know, social networking and stuff. So we're, we're definitely um, moving in that direction. Um, so. 
My name is Melanie, and I am a personal trainer, and I could spend probably a lot of time with every single one of you on this topic. Um, but just to get personal about my situation, I spent the last six years training professionally in Washington, D.C. with the uber-powerful type A who manage their fitness the exact same way they manage their professions. Relocated here, which meant that not only did my clients lose a trainer, and most of them are not lined up with anybody else yet, but I lost my income. I'm 10 years into my profession and I'm in the position of starting over from scratch. Um, so I'd be very curious, Christina, um, to know what the business model is for the change leader and the potential for me to reconnect with my clients in Washington, D.C., still be involved in their fitness. And from David's perspective, without giving myself one more thing that I'm supposed to manage electronically, but to actually be able to create additional revenue streams. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. um, early in our company, we talked a lot about serving personal trainers, and um, this is a perfect tool for personal trainers. The reason we're not going after you is you're hard to reach and you're individuals. It's not a great business model for us, but the tool is a fit for sure. Um, and the revenue stream, you can charge a monthly membership fee for this. We did our own consumer product. Um, we call it's called Mobile Dent Workout, and we were just you know getting user input and developing our product through user input with that consumer product. But um, we know that you can actually charge an end user population for this, and you can probably charge your end user population a monthly fee that's based on your relationship with them and the value that they perceive out of you personally. So I'm sure you could charge a better rate than we did. We were not an established brand in the consumer world in terms of fitness, um, but. Yeah, it's it's a it's the right tool for you. I mean, it, it will work for you, and we should talk after the meeting. You can try it. Yeah, license the technology, and uh, you know, reconnect with your East Coast uh, clientele, and then from there, I mean, it's obviously, it's very leverageable if uh, you know your clientele in Washington likes it, and then you know they can perhaps through social, um, you know, networking, spread the word, and and. Uh, um, you know, expand beyond that initial client base. I mean, it sounds great. I mean, see if it works out, but it's, you know, it sounds like a really leverageable, compelling idea to check into. And I didn't say this to you, but the model is really, it's an annual subscription fee. We didn't really talk so much about nutrition. Um, obviously, you all know and recognize that it's a component as much as fitness is. And we see that with this whole model, we're, we're going for a bottom up as opposed to top down approach to you know to dealing with all of these issues and um, well I have a couple questions um, one is d does anybody know uh, what the population of uh, and we talked about how many people have smartphones but do we know of that segment how many people are using any of these any sorts of tools to manage their health does anybody have that or have a ballpark how many people are currently using, using smartphones well, for? No, yeah, using smart, specifically using tools to manage their health with one of these devices. I, I think I think if you if you uh, a, a good way to see is to, to uh, go to the app store, and um, in in health and fitness apps, there's tons of people downloading um, calorie counting. So uh, the people who who are into that. That there, there are huge numbers. I, I, I don't know the numbers off the top of my head. Um, the pr one problem with uh, the people who are using apps is a lot of apps um, get used uh, initially and then trail off. Right. So, so there's a certain stickiness uh, factor that needs to be there. But um, I know that the health and fitness category um, has has been one of the categories that has always been considered the the area that, that has the most potential. Mm -hmm. um, and I think that um, when, for instance, um, when you have to actually input your, your caloric intake every single time you put something in your mouth, it gets a little, I mean, it's a little, you'll do it for a month and then right. it'll drop off. This, this calorie, I don't know how they magically do it, but this thing that you could put on and know what your intake was that's that's fabulous the, mm -hmm. so you know the the uh, again as i said automagically it has to happen automatically um, for it to really um, take off um, yeah, there, a, there, oh, there are about uh, over 1500 health and fitness apps i think in the 
iTunes store or the, the app store. And there are a number of uh, popular ones for nutrition and diet, sort of what you're eating, you can input and it estimates the, and so you put in Apple and it estimates the number of calories. So those types of apps exist. Um, I'm also curious um, if anybody can comment. Um, my, my business is, is, um, is a, a software that, that deals with nutrition, which is was why I ask. But with the research I've done, um, and I know that this is changing some with more integrative care coming, but as that, that most doctors, unless you're actually schooled in nutrition, most doctors don't know a whole lot about nutrition. And what I'm wondering is if you can speak on the relationship that can be or should be forming between these, you know, private companies. I think yours is, is maybe a good example where we, you know, we see a need that, um, you know, doctors and the more, the, the whole Western practice is maybe not filling. And so we come in with products to begin to fill that need and begin to engage with users, but those users ultimately go back and should be engaging with their doctors, you know, so to create this sort of loop. And my, my question is, how much do you think um, doctors are, are really engaging and, and willing, to, willing to engage with these, these new programs, these, these new softwares, and are they, is that making sense? Like, are they compliant? Are they excited about this? Um, or are they, do, you, do you see them as still being resistant? I actually had a customer who is a, is a doctor and who contacted me. And he, he said, you know, Michael, uh, things are changing. And, and I know that one day I'm going to be paid based on results. And so, you know, he, he had a particular interest in what we were doing. And he, he said, you know, I'm even thinking about giving an iPod Touch to, to my patients so that we can track this, so that together we can produce results, because that's what I'm going to be paid for in, down the road. But I'd re be real interested in, in your thoughts on that as well. It, it generally seems sort of based on the studies that doctors like wireless health models, because it gives them more information more timely information, and it also makes them mobile. Uh, and they, they don't have to be in a particular place. Um, so the general view is that the doctors are receptive. Where the problem comes about is where their business model is, is going to be affected. And so there is a, but as, as, a, as a user, they really like it. If it's uh, disrupting the business model, then they really dislike it. And so sometimes those are independent, sometimes they meet. Maybe so, something else is also, sorry, um, no um, you, you know, recognizing that it, that it's a good thing and if the business model can be adapted so it makes make sense for them, um, you know, deciding which one to work with. Um, and remember in the beginning with uh, the internet, and doctors used to go crazy when their patients, like my mom, for example, <laughs> would, would come in with her stack of internet printouts and, you know, no, not another one, another one of these. And, you know, that was a big boon for a while. But then, you know, to some extent that, you know, the, the doctors would, you know, the companies would come and say, hey, how about if we private label it and it's stuff that's, you know, already screened by the you know, AMA or you can screen it or, or endorse certain parts of it and you can, you can direct your patients to a certain place rather than the whole wide internet, you know, well, you know, here, this one makes sense, you can go to, and there's other good ones too, but I've looked at this one and I feel good about it. Um, so, so maybe there's, if there's a lot of it out there and they don't know where to gravitate to, um, I think eventually that they will tie this in. Um, so it's about, you know, if your business is maybe, maybe local, I don't know, but, you know, um, somehow getting into, uh, be that one that, for whatever reason, they feel comfortable with and trust, and and um, uh, get get past the noise that that's out there. Is it safe, kind of safe to say that the easier it is to fold into their practice, the, the more likely they are to Absolutely. use it. Absolutely. So and as there's that, still a financial incentive for them, or it's not, it's going to improve their business and not detract from. 
Right, I think that's a good point. I mean, the national incentive would be one thing, but if it's something that's easy for them to do, like um, getting rid of that, those stacks of internet printouts and just kind of, maybe they don't make money by saying go to this site, but it's still, it's a it lifestyle it improvement for them. I have to make one last comment. We were just laughing here during your presentation. Two question limit, sorry. Oh, no, well, just, I, just I kidding, thought everybody just kidding. was finished. Just kidding, no, go ahead. Um, I know that this, there's still a lot of research being done on the links between um, mobile devices, specifically more iPhones and brain tumors and brain cancer. And as soon as you started talking about putting a telephone under your pillow while you sleep, the, the alert just came up for, for us. And, um, and then talking about how you're going to eat something and that is going to signal back. And, can, I, I just, you just have to say something more about that because that just sounds like a god awful idea to me. Yeah, I, I think uh, the, the idea of eating uh, a pill, uh, taking a pill that has some electronics in it and then essentially the electronics goes through your system is, is a little bit disconcerting, but, but FDA seems to be okay with it. Uh, the companies are moving forward and getting FDA approval. Uh, say, same with wireless. I, I, I guess there are many people who wear the earpieces with Bluetooth and they're on the phone all day long. In the case of putting an iPhone uh, under your pillow, it's actually not sending information. It's just either recording sound or recording movement. Uh, it, uh, in many of these apps, there's really not a healthcare provider that the information would go to. And even if you are sending the information to a healthcare provider, you can just do it overnight and then do it in one shot when it's done. So it's not any more than uh, sort of the, the normal exposure that one has. It's not actually like transmitting to them as you're sleeping and... and no, but, but you know, some of the smart patches could depending on the application. Uh, but again, the, the FDA has, uh, has thresholds on how much power can be near the human body. Okay. So you might want to try the iPod Touch uh, <laughs> under your pillow instead of the iPhone if you're worried about that. So there's time for one more question, and I, I think I'm going to pose it, actually. Um, sorry. So they, this is to you, David, and, and obviously all, all the rest of you feel free to to interject as well. But based on what you've heard tonight and seen, um, what, what platform or course do, do you see as is potentially representing the most compelling monetization opportunity? Um, is it subscription apps, uh, you know, software as a service, uh, development of equipment and hardware tools, licensing and sale of equipment and hardware, or, uh, you know, potentially um, just the, the app, selling the app itself, like an iPhone app or iPad app or what have you. What, do you have any sense? What, what are your thoughts there? <laughs> I, I, it's an open-ended question, but I mean. Yeah, I, I don't know. I just, I just think it probably depends so much on, on the you know, specific um, product or, or application and um, you know, how much of the value of, of, of a business is going to be in uh, the device versus the applications. I mean, there's certainly all kinds of, of ways ways to do it. And you know, a lot of the companies that we're involved with, um, they got to kind of experiment a little bit with that. And you know, ultimately, you want to define your own economics as best you can, and sell it that way if you can get away with it, um, and, and have you know fewer rather than more options. But you know, we, we, when when the market's sort of emerging. And you're just you have different types of customers uh, with with different um, uh, kind of constraints or or interests in how they want to pay for something. You might have to be flexible. I, I mean, a lot of our companies that sell the hospitals, you know, some will not pay a monthly fee or software as a service. They say, hey, I'm going to be paying for this month after month after month. I want to buy it today and own it. Others say, hey, no, that's too hard to pull off, and it's a big chunk. I want to just kind of bury it, you know, you know, in, in monthly. Um, and so I think you just have to kind of kind of play that out. And, and again, um, that's for really a business sale, and, and you can kind of understand your customer and, and what their needs are and, and what their 
budget processes, et cetera. Now, when it comes to the consumer, once again, I have no idea. I think it's hard, and I think if you figure that out, you know, how much a consumer, I think, I got my first iPod last December, and I love it to death. I can't believe I haven't had one for longer. And I think the 99 cents for a song is just brilliant. I, I, I just, I do that all day long, because it's only 99 cents. Actually, most of the ones I buy are dollar twenty-nine for some reason. I don't know why, but but it's it's a price point that you know. Um, Golden oldies. Yeah. Well, okay, I gave myself away there. Um, but another example, just that scares me to death about consumers. My ability to understand it is one of our investments we made long ago. Actually, it was a different firm. Acacia wouldn't do a restaurant investment, but we did a restaurant investment um, in, a, in a company called Chevy's, which you know did well, and I I still go there like once a week, which. I'm not proud of. I probably need you know to subscribe to several services here to deal with that. But you know, early on, they spent years trying to get the menu right and the pricing, and they kept changing it. They say, okay, we you know, for whatever reason, this 11.99 is giving people a problem. We got to get that down to 10.99. But to make that work, we got to shrink the portions down a little bit. And you know, the way they play around with the margaritas, you know, pricing drives me nuts as well. So I mean, it's 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 tricky to figure out. Pricing and, and, and pricing models. Um, so, I, I, boy, you know, I just think it really you got to do your marketing and research and figure that out on a case by case basis. Great. Well, uh, thank you all for joining us, uh, Moran, Christina, Michael, David, and of course you all. It took a good effort to get out here with the weather the way it is, and, and uh, we very much appreciate it. Thank you.